Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Hi, welcome, Michelle. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome back to our lecture series uh, from uh, Dr. Goda. The previous lecture is about the deep structure of culture, and the topic for today is the necessity and methods of comparison. Welcome, uh, Dr. Goda. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, shall I start now? Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, as you know, the, our topic to, today is about the necessity and the importance of uh, comparison. And actually, uh, uh, there is a very interesting uh, paper uh, by Alan uh, McFarlane called To Contrast, to contrast and Compare. Uh, it's a bit uh, theoretical. But uh, it outlines to I to, to, to it outlines to, to us uh, the main idea and uh, the main concepts and the structure of uh, comparison uh, and the difference between comparing and uh, contrasting. So uh, I will try to uh, to introduce to you this uh, paper uh, to familiarize ourselves with the uh, theoretical frame of. Uh, contrasting and comparing. And after that, there is another paper by uh, Professor Zhang Longxi, uh, a very famous Chinese uh, scholar. It's a, we can say it's a practical, a practical approach to uh, comparison. And uh, I will introduce to you that paper also, uh, maybe in the second part of our lecture. Uh, which I find very uh, interesting and very important. These two papers are so uh, important uh, for anyone who is interested in uh, comparing uh, co cultural, comparative cultural studies in general and uh, sinologists in, uh, in particular. Uh, as I said last week, it's very important to uh, compare between things. And actually uh, our minds work uh, this way, it always works in a frame of uh, comparison. We always compare between uh, things. In our understanding of everything, it's always there is internal operation going on in our brain, comparing things uh, together. Uh, for example, for example, if you if you say about somebody, describe somebody that he is tall. Let's say somebody is let's say 180 centimeter, and you describe that person, let's call him Mr. Chen, for example. You describe Mr. Chen as a tall person. Because Why? Because you already made a comparison in your mind between his height and the average height. Let's say the average height is 170 centimeter, but that Mr. Chen, if he goes to, uh, to Sweden, for example, uh, this 180 centimeter will not be considered tall at all because the average there is almost 180. So he has to be 190 in order to be called tall. But even that person, if he stands next to Yao Ming, for example, the Chinese basketball player, he will look small and short. So it's always comparative. And always, whenever we describe anything or whenever we understand anything, it always happens in a comparative uh, mode. So uh, as last week, uh, uh, Michelle asked me if the comparison will be uh, in time between two different times. Of course, this is one uh, part of having a comparison, usually in history. When we study history, usually we compare between uh, two times, like ancient times and modern times and so on. But uh, in, in social studies, the comparison happens in uh, spatial, spatial sets, in space, not in time, not temporal comparison comparison, but spatial uh, comparison. So uh, here the comparison can be either uh, synchronic, meaning uh, the, the comparing between two things that happen or exist at the same time, or diachronic, that means two things, they happen in uh, two different times. And the, the, the comparison here is uh, spatial, uh, not uh, temporal. Uh, we understand everything through comparison. As I said, uh, Evans uh, Pritchard, uh, he said, uh, in the widest sense, there is no other method 
Comparison is, of course, one of the essential procedures of all sciences and one of the elementary process, processes of human thoughts. So we are indulging ourselves in comparison all the time without, uh, without being conscious of the comparison we are making all the time, even in the, 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 the small details of our daily life. And uh, I would quote also Rudyard Kipling here in his poem, The English Flag. Uh, he said, and what should they know of England who only England know? That means those who only know about England, English people, if they know this, that means they don't know England itself. They don't know their country itself. So we do not know our culture unless we compare it to or with another uh, culture. Uh, David Hume, the Scottish uh, philosopher, one of the um, most important philosophers in the uh, Enlightenment uh, age, he said the views the most familiar to us are opt for that very reason to escape us. David Hume is a philosopher known of his uh, skepticism, philosophy of skepticism, and he encouraged uh, his readers and encouraged us to uh, to be skeptic of everything, to question everything. Of course, uh, we can disagree with him about certain things, like, for example, his denial of the first cause. But uh, uh, this point to be skeptic and to question, to question everything, to question our own uh, culture, our own, our own habits, our own daily routines. This is, uh, I find, uh, very uh, important and actually helps us to understand our culture more and understand ourselves uh, more. Uh, Karl Marx said, human history is like uh, paleontology, owing to a certain judicial blindness. Even the best intelligences absolutely fall to see the things which lie in front of their nose. We fail to see things that, that are so close to us. And because they are so close to us, we fail to see them. We fail to see uh, things that that's so familiar uh, to us. Uh, I remember one, there is an Indian uh, thinker. He once gave a, le a lecture and he said, uh, if uh, if somebody, for example, didn't brush his uh, his teeth for three days, you can smell you can smell him like if uh, one meter away, but but we cannot or we do not smell our own mouth if we didn't brush our teeth for a, for even a week. We do not smell our own mouth even though the distance between our nose and our mouth is so short. It's almost like one centimeter, but we cannot and we do not uh, smell it. This is exactly false in line with this same idea. We are, we are opt to uh, overlook the things that are very familiar and so close to us. And I will come to this point uh, in the second part of our lecture, and I will introduce to you another paper and uh, based on uh, a Chinese poem that really reflects this point uh, so well. So the purpose of comparisons, uh, why do we, of course, as I said already, it's very important to do comparison. It helps us to understand uh, our own culture and our own selves. But uh, uh, how about the mechanism of this comparison? Uh, how to do it? The, the right steps to do comparison. This is very important topic uh, to scholars, uh, no matter what discipline they are uh, specialized in, and very important to students also, uh, undergraduate or postgraduate students who try to write uh, an essay or a paper uh, trying to compare between uh, two things, uh, two texts or two cultures, two civilizations, uh, whether they are students of literature or comparative uh, cultural studies or, or what, or whatever. So there are certain mechanism we need to follow when we do any comparison. First thing, the first phase, let's call let's call them two phases. The first phase, the first stage is asking questions. The second stage is testing answers. We ask questions first. We try to come up with, with, with some questions and certain uh, hypotheses, and then we try to test the answers we may have. The first thing 
when in the first stage of asking questions or suggesting questions, posing questions, the first thing we should do is distancing the over-familiar. What is the over-familiar? Is our daily routine, our local and native culture. We need to distance ourselves. This is just uh, reflects what I have just said and all the, the quotes I, I have just read uh, by Karl Marx and uh, David Hume. We need to distance ourselves a little bit from our native and local culture in order to see our culture with fresh eyes, to see our culture anew. Okay, so the first thing we need to do here is a reverse telescope. Telescope, usually we use it in order to see the minute uh, uh, microbes that we need to, to magnify them under the telescope by maybe millions of times in order to see the microbes and the viruses. But here we need to use this technique that's reverse telescope, reverse, to, to, to look at it from distance. To look at the familiar, the over-familiar habits, thoughts, things from a distance. We look at, at what we do as though we are strangers to ourselves, with foreign eyes. In other words, we turn the obvious into unobvious. We turn the obvious. This is something, actually, uh, we, for those who who, who lived overseas, and when they return to their homeland after a few years of living abroad, they can see things that they failed to see when they were living in their homeland. After being away from their homeland for a few years, and when they go back, they start to see things differently, and they wonder why people speak in this way. Why people, why my own people? This You are talking about your own people. Why your own people speak in this way or think? You start to see things differently. Um, so the most popular is opt to escape us, as uh, David Hume uh, said. For example, the fish, the fish in the water. The fish is the, is the last creature that can realize the existence of water because the fish lives in the water all the time. All the time. That's why it can't really realize the existence of water. The same way with the birds in the air. The birds in the air also opt to, to miss the existence of the air and uh, will realize the, the, the existence of these things only when we when we get uh, problem uh, uh, related to them. Like, for example, we never realize that we are fine and healthy unless we, we fall sick unless we fall sick. So like having headache, for example, or stomach ache, and then we, we start to feel that we, we start to be conscious of our internal organs only when, when we got uh, Trump. Uh, so here, when we describe uh, any society, even our own society, we need to look at it as a foreign society. We need to look at it as a, when we go overseas, for example, and live in a foreign society, uh, what, we, what we notice right away is the things that attract our eyes. It's not the common, if you go, for example, you as a Chinese person, you go to, to, to Japan, you will not notice that the people are using chopsticks because this is something you, all, you also do, but you notice the things that, that they do and you do not do in your, in your country. Okay, we always notice the unfamiliar the, when we leave our country. So only by contrast, there can be full understanding. Contrasting things A and B uh, through this comparison and contrasting, uh, there can be uh, full understanding. The second thing we should do is familiarizing the distance familiarizing when we go overseas maybe the whole society we live in is so foreign to us so we need to familiarize ourselves with this foreign culture so we need here to use a technique called a telescope view this is not a reverse telescope no no we use the telescope in the usual way meaning to magnify things meaning we get closer to that 
local to that foreign society, which is foreign to us, okay? You go to live in Canada, for example, in France, in Germany, wherever, it's a foreign society to you. People do things and behave in, in a certain way that's foreign to you. So here you need to use this telescope view in order to get closer to their culture, in order to understand their culture and understand why they behave in such a way and why they, they, they speak or do the, these things. Uh, David Hume says, uh, regarding this the, this foreign phenomenon, what whatever we see, things that uh, foreign to us, sometimes they 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 sound and they seem irrational and nonsense. In this respect, David Hume, the Scottish uh, philosopher, said, "Let an object be presented to a man of never so strong natural reason and abilities, meaning somebody who is not strong, not intellectual, not not uh, uh, smart." somebody who is not intellectual, not smart, okay, not intelligent. If that object be entirely new to him, he will not be able by the most accurate examination of its sensible qualities to discover any of its causes or effects. Meaning it needs intelligence in order to, to understand a foreign culture, to understand its causes and uh, effects. It needs uh, intelligence. And uh, also, uh, we need to, to think of possible alternative models of things. We always need to, to think of a, a third alternative. What if the situation was this? What if, the, if we behave differently? What if the, we always try to come up with and or provide a new hypothesis? What if? What if something happens? What if we do things differently and so on? Uh, this is all about asking uh, questions. Also it's about the asking questions regarding things that are not there, things that are absent. This is making absences avail uh, visible, revealing absences, meaning, meaning we, whether we talk about our society or about foreign society, when we try to, to make any comparison, we always should ask about the things that do not exist in that society. Not only about the things that exist in the society and the things that we experience, but we also should ask about the things that do not exist at all or existed at a certain uh, time and then ceased to exist. Uh, for example, these reversing questions, if someone asked someone asked the scholar about uh, the ancestor worship worship in Japan, why it still why does it still exist in Japan? And he turned the question upside down and he said, this is not an interesting question. The interesting question is to ask why it died out in the West. Why it died out? So here you ask about what is missing. You don't you don't only have to ask about the things you experience you can also ask about the things that do not exist, the things that are missing, the absent uh, things. Here, we do not say that uh, asking why the, the, the ancestor worship uh, still exists in, Jap in Japan, we don't say that this question is not interesting. It is interesting, but uh, it might be more interesting or it may, it may add a certain uh, or a deeper uh, dimension if we ask why it died out in the West or in another part of the world. So we always need to ask about the interesting things that either happened and see, happened in, in the past and ceased to exist anymore, or about th things that did not happen uh, at all. So we use this comparative framework as a back cloth, as a background as a background to project the foreground. What is the foreground here? The foreground here is our culture. Is our culture. Is then like you compare A to B or A with B. A is your culture, for example, your native culture, but you need a back cloth, backdrop, background of a foreign culture, okay, in order to project your own culture, in order to understand your own culture not only understanding the, the foreign culture. And uh, so we need to, uh, to pay attention and to, uh, to put 
equal emphasis on both similarities and dissimilarities, similarities and differences. Not only, of course, uh, when we contrast between two things, we focus only on the differences, okay? But when we compare, we focus on both, both similarities and uh, dissimilarities or differences. After finishing this uh, stage, then we come to the testing answers. We need to test our answers. We need to test the, the hypothesis we have put forward to see if our hypothesis uh, is correct or, or not, whatever hypothesis we may, we may put forward. And uh, actually, this is also very scientific method because, because uh, sci science is based on hypothesis. All scientists, they have to provide and pose uh, an hypothesis first, and they try so many experiments, one after another, to test this hypothesis. To, to see if they work uh, or not. Uh, we also need, when we test our answers, we need to search for causal connections. Causal, what always ask why and how, why things happen this way and how it happened. Trying to find the a causal, causal connection, the reason, the reason, the, the cause and effect. For example, we can ask questions and this example uh, has been uh, brought forward by Max Weber, the German uh, sociologist uh, and uh, anthropologist, uh, like, like Calvinism, for example. He suggested that Calvinism is the root of capitalism. Calvinism is, uh, is let's say, is a branch of uh, fr the French branch of uh, Protestantism. Okay, Protestantism is is, Christ, is a Christian sect that uh, started by Martin Luther uh, in 1517, uh, exactly on the, on the 31st of October, 1517, when he went to the church and he put 99 uh, objections that he protested against the, 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 the church in Rome, the Catholic church in Rome. And that's why his sect later on became to be known as Protestantism because they protest, protested against the authority of the church and so on. So for example, Max Weber, he said that Calvinism is the root of capitalism, of our modern capitalism. And uh, also suggested to ask questions like, uh, are there capitalist societies that are not Calvinist? And uh, to compare between between a, a society, if there, if this kind of society exists, to compare between this kind of society that is capitalist and Calvinist and another society that's only capitalist, but not uh, Calvinist. The idea is always to get ourselves used to ask questions and to find these causal connections between uh, things. And also searching for more co-variations beyond our society, like imagining a different type, a different pattern of society. Not only the society we live in, but uh, other variations of this society. Always we need to give our imagination, uh, you know, a freedom to imagine things that do not really uh, exist. Uh, also, the generalizations, uh, even though uh, historians, uh, some of them, they, they claim that they don't pass uh, general, any general, uh, general statements, but usually they do. And uh, we also, we need to test this general, generalization. Whatever general statement will make, we need to cross, uh, we need to test them and examine them cross comparatively. Uh, like comparing between, for example, if we talk about as, the, as an example between uh, the English law, in order to, to understand it, if we talk about it and if we want to understand it, we need to understand it against a backdrop of the, the law of uh, Western uh, Europe, for example. Uh, and also we can uh, examine a single system and compare it with a whole uh, system, like uh, uh, comparing, for example, civiliz civilization uh, uh, be between one civilization and another. And uh, this is uh, very essential 
in order to uh, for scholars in order to understand their own civilization and this is something western scholars did all the time uh, comparing western civilizations to to eastern civilizations in general and to like uh, selecting one civilization like Japanese civilization or Indian civilization or Chinese civilization and comparing between Western civilization and uh, let's say Indian or Chinese civilization. And sometimes they they choose three different uh, civilizations uh, to compare uh, between uh, each other. So the methods of uh, comparison here, uh, if, if, we, if we talk, for example, about uh, Emil Durkheim, uh, he has three types of uh, approaches uh, to do uh, comparison. The first comparison, the, very, the first method is a single society at a given time, and we analyze its broad variations in, a, in certain modes or action. For example, we will analyze smoking in Hong Kong. Only Hong Kong or only Beijing or only Shanghai. We don't compare it to another or with another city. No, we, we look at this uh, phenomenon, smoking, for example, and we compare uh, between a phenomenon, for example, uh, in the higher class or the middle class, or uh, between uh, in workers class, or or uh, between one part in Hong Kong and another uh, part, and put it in different modes, so it's within one single uh, society. The second approach we compare between several societies of generally similar nature, but differ in certain uh, modes, like smoking in Hong Kong and Japan, Hong Kong or Shanghai and Japan, for example, or Shanghai and Hong Kong. They are similar in many things that they are both Asians, Asian, they are both Asian, and uh, they are both uh, uh, metropolitan uh, cities and so on, uh, but they are still different in many other ways. So we can hold this is another approach is to compare uh, between two societies. We select one phenomenon, for example, and, and compare between this phenomenon in one society and the same phenomenon in another uh, society. The third approach, numerous societies, widely different uh, in nature, yet sharing some identical uh, features or different periods showing uh, radical changes in the same uh, society different periods, like uh, selecting or picking one, one phenomenon and uh, comparing between that pheno phenomenon 100 years ago and the same phenomenon in our time now, within the same society or within or in more than two uh, societies. So these are three types of approaches to do uh, comparisons according to Emil uh, Durkheim. The unit of comparisons, what kind of things are suitable for comparisons? Because there are certain things are not suitable for comparisons. We need to, uh, to compare between two things that they have some common uh, characteristics. They are different in some ways, but they are similar in some ways too. So we need to compare between things of the same order of magnitude. That's why we cannot compare, for example, between handshake in England and the family system in China. The handshake in England is a tiny social behavior, small social behavior. We cannot compare it with such magnitude, such uh, a, major, uh, a major social uh, system like the family system in China. They don't match, okay? The other thing is to compare things of the same class or same order. That's why we cannot compare between marriage in America, for example, and tea drinking in China. They don't belong to, to the same family. They are completely different in nature. We cannot make this comparison. That's why when we make any comparison, we need to make sure that the unit of comparison, unit here meaning object, the object we, we compare or we use for our comparison, they have to match. There, there must be some connection between these two things. They belong to the same family, for example, and so on. And comparing relations of things, not things. When we compare between two things, two objects, two units, 
we don't compare between things in themselves. We compare between their values, their relationships, relationships to the people, for example. Uh, when we compare between marriage in America or in the West and marriage in China, we don't compare between the marriage itself in, in itself, but the, the value behind it, the, the relationship between that thing and the society uh, itself, uh, for example. There are also uh, two types of uh, comparison. One is called controlled comparison and one is general comparison. The general comparison is general comparison, like, like uh, comparing between two uh, civilizations, uh, for example. But uh, the, the, the limited or the controlled uh, comparison, uh, the range of differences uh, is limited. And, uh, and here Edward Lure says, uh, the controlled comparison is the, met the methods of intensively comparing groups of common derivation or with a basically identical culture yet differing in some specific uh, factor. The point being to ascertain what other elements likewise uh, differ. Uh, so actually contrast and compare it, there are two different things. As I said earlier, uh, to contrast is to focus on the dissimilarity, on the differences. You need to, here you need to, to compare between two things that, that they are more different than, uh, than uh, united or similar. Uh, while comparing, you, you focus on both. You focus on the similarities and the, the dissimilarities. Some scholars prefer to focus on the contrast, while others prefer to focus on the comparison. Which one is better? When you want to make a comparison, you need to decide for yourselves first, before you start making this comparison, which, which side you want to focus on uh, uh, more. You want to focus on the differences or the similarities or both. As I said, uh, scholars uh, had different opinions regarding it. For example, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the, the French, the French uh, uh, philosopher uh, who, who lived from 1712 to 1778, uh, he said, one needs to look near at hand if one wants to study men, but to study men, one must learn to look from afar, from distance. So this falls in line with what we, we said earlier, to distance ourselves from the over familiar. Because we live in community with people, we are so close to people, but in order to study these people, around us, we need to distance ourselves from them a little bit in order to understand uh, them. One must first observe differences in order to discover attributes, in order to, to discover the similarities between two things, we need first to, dis to observe the differences. So here we find that Jean-Jacques Rousseau prefers to focus on the differences, not on the similarities. Uh, Evans uh, Pritchard said, I would like to place emphasis on the importance for social anthropology as a comparative discipline of differences, because it could be held that in the past, the tendency has often been to place stress on similarities, whereas it is uh, the differences which would seem to invite uh, sociological uh, explanation. So uh, this is uh, involved question for institutions have to be similar in some respect before they can be different in, another, in others. Uh, another one, David Francis uh, Pocock, more formal comparison is both pos possible and desirable. But here again, the concern will be not with similarities only, but with differences also for the sake of uh, heightened understanding. So some scholars prefer to focus on the, on, the, on the differences, while others prefer to focus on the uh, similarities. But according to uh, Alan uh, McFarlane, it's better to focus on both 
it's when we uh, make any uh, comparison, it's better to focus on both similarities and uh, and uh, uh, these similarities and differences. Now, how many polars? How many? If we want to make a comparison, how many polars we can use? And uh, like comparing between two things or three or five, how many things we can use? How many units we can use? Uh, right, Mill says often you get the best insight insights by considering extremes, extremes, different polars. Uh, by thinking of the opposite of that with which you are directly concerned. If you think about this pair, think also, then also think about elation. If you study the miser, then also uh, the spin fit. When you pick something to, to, uh, to understand it or to make a comparison between it and, and something else, try to find the other side of, or the opposite, the, the complete op opposite of, of uh, that thing. It's polar, it's extreme opposite. In order to project each other, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's desirable to, to have as many as you can, more than two, not just uh, not just two units, comparing between two units. So to contrast is only a start. We only try to find differences just as a start. A start to have a true uh, comparison. A true comparison is based on both similarities and differences. This is, nowadays, modern scholars, they tend to, uh, to have this uh, understanding and to follow this line that uh, the, the, the true comparison is based on both and to as I said to have as many uh, as uh, possible how many poles of comparison here as I said earlier we cannot just randomly pick out any any two objects to to make comparisons no they have to to be of similar uh, nature uh, and uh, the method of contrast is based on dichotomies with one seen as the normal, the normal which is, let's say, your culture. Your culture, you will consider it the normal, the natural. And the other as deviation, as the other, or something different from, from your culture. And it's better to, to choose a, a triadic mode, uh, meaning meaning more than two, meaning three, three objects to, to make a, a comparison. Uh, I remember when I, when I, uh, when I did my, uh, my PhD dissertation, it was a comparison study, comparative study of uh, prosody, Western prosody, Chinese prosody, and, and Arabic prosody. Prosody is the study of meter, by the way. The study of meter is the, the rhythm of poetry, okay? So I, I chose, five uh, poetics, different poetics, uh, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, and German. And my professor, my supervisor, uh, was Professor Zhang Wongsi. Then one day I asked him, is it better to just to focus on Arabic, English, and Chinese? Because I feel at that time, I felt that five uh, poetics might be too many. And he said, no the more the better. Since it's a comparison, then the more the better. The more the more, the more the, the you have, the richer your comparison uh, will, will be. And I discovered later on that his opinion was uh, quite true. So also there is another thing called an ideal uh, type that, that was said by Max Weber, he's German, so Max uh, Weber. He, uh, he called it uh, Gedanken Builder. Gedanken Builder is, uh, is also to imagine an ideal object or an ideal phenomenon, ideal behavior, ideal society. So when you compare, for example, between two things, maybe one of these two things is, is just uh, imaginary, is not, re not real. You compare between your society now and what it should be, between what your behavior now and how you should behave, for example. Something that doesn't exist, but 
you imagine uh, it as an ideal uh, type. He called it uh, Gedanken Builder. And uh, uh, Alan McFarlane also agrees with that. And he also adds his own understanding by say this triangulation. Triangulation is, is to add a third element. If you compare between A and B, then try to add C also to compare between these three things. That's, that will make sure you don't uh, take sides. Like if you compare between China and Japan, then try to include, uh, sorry, China and America, for example. If you compare between uh, in anything, uh, select any topic, any topic, and you could take China and America as examples to make the comparison, then it would be your comparison or your study would be more interesting if you add Japan as well. Why? Because Japan has similarities and dissimilarities with both sides. Japan is similar to China, that it is an Asian uh, country, and it is similar to America also because it's very westernized. So in a way, it falls in the middle between China and America. So when you make this comparison using this triangulation of comparison, as suggested by Alan uh, McFarlane, your comparison will be uh, more interesting and uh, very rich. Uh, and this is, many scholars did that, uh, like uh, Tocqueville, uh, he compared between France, England, and America. France, England, America. The comparison is between France and America, but then he included England as just a, a middle party between uh, France and America. Uh, Norman Jacobs could uh, compare between China, Japan, and Europe. Uh, again, that the comparison between China and Europe, but Japan acts as a middle factor here, and so on. Between India, Europe, uh, Japan, the comparison between India and Japan, but Europe acts as uh, just uh, a middle uh, factor between them. So. We also try, it would, the comparison would be so important if we add this Gedanken Builder or the ideal type, the thing that does not exist except in our mind, we imagine it to be there. We we'll compare between what our behavior, our present behavior and our future behavior, our ide ideal behavior, how we should behave, for example, okay? Uh, and uh, we may include triangulation, this, uh, the, the third uh, party, okay? Uh, before I move to the, the, next, the, next, uh, the next paper, uh, if you have any questions so far, so far this is uh, the theoretical frame of comparison and uh, contrasting. If you have any question, if there is anything uh, um, unclear, uh, difficult, a bit abstract, you need me to further explain it, to go through it again, please let me know. Uh, if not, I will uh, talk about another, uh, we'll take a Chinese poem, okay, and we'll try to to demonstrate this distancing the over-familiar and familiarizing the distant on that Chinese poem. So it will be like a uh, practical application of this comparison and also a study, a study in how Western scholars uh, study uh, Chinese history and uh, you know the dichotomy between Western scholars, Sinologists and uh, Chinese uh, scholars. Uh, regarding studying uh, Chinese history. So if there is anything uh, unclear about this theoretical introduction, please feel free to ask me now uh, before I, I resume. Is there any question? If, uh, if you have no question, then I will go on. I'll show you the slides very quickly. So if you have any Thing unclear, you can ask me. I recommend this paper uh, to you too. You can download it uh, online. It's called uh, To Contrast and Compare 
by Alan McFarlin. You can find the PDF online. It's very interesting and not that uh, difficult to understand. Okay, uh, if there is no question, so maybe I should go on, All right? The other paper is by Professor Zhang Rongxi, and it's called Lessons from Mount Lu, China and Cross-Cultural Understanding. Uh, Mount Lu is a mount in China, uh, Lu Shan, okay? And there is a very famous uh, poem by Su Shi. Uh, the poem, this is the translation of uh, Professor uh, Zhang Rongxi. Uh, Hong Kan Chong Ling, Si Chong Feng, Yuan Jing Gao Di, Ge Bu Tong, and there is another version for it, Dao Chu Kan Shen La Bu Tong. Wu Shi Lu Shan Zhen Mian Mu, Ju Yuan Shen Zai Si Shan Zhong. His translation goes like this. Viewed horizontally, a range, a cliff from the side. It differs as we move high or low or far or nearby. We do not know the true face of Mount Lu because we are all ourselves inside. This is a very famous uh, poem in uh, classical Chinese uh, literature, and uh, especially the last two lines. The last two lines, uh, we do not know the true face of Mount Lu because we are all ourselves inside. What does it mean when we read? What is our, the first impression we get when we read such a poem? What does uh, Su Shi tries to try to say in such a poem? Of course, the uh, the first impression we get, and so many people understand the poem in this way, is that. Since we are so close to Mount Lu, we shall not see it truly. We shall not see and shall, shall never know the true essence and the true face of Mount Lu. That means, it means if we distance ourselves, if we go farther from Mount Lu, we will be able to see it clearly and to get a better idea and better understanding and better view of Mount Lu. If we take this example in uh, sinologies and uh, the study of Chinese culture, does it mean that native, Chinese native uh, scholars, they cannot understand Chinese history as much as Western scholars, because Western scholars, they are not inside the Mount Lu. They are not Chinese. According to the poem, understanding the poem, just uh, uh, judging at uh, surface level, it's Chinese scholars will not fully understand Chinese history because they are Chinese. So Chinese history is so close to them. They live in this history. But we need a scholar who is outsider, an outsider, to understand, to look at that history and understand it. And those outsiders, those scholars, Western scholars, for example, they are able to understand Chinese history and Chinese literature better than native speakers. There are many people understand the poem in this way, but Professor Zhang Longxi, he offers a different understanding and different explanation. First, in, the, in, in his paper, he talked about sinology and the sinologists as outsiders. They are the outsiders who study Chinese history from distance. So the question uh, he poses here, are they able to understand this Chinese history better than Chinese people, Chinese scholars? And uh, China itself, China and Chinese history uh, has been taken as an object uh, studied by 
by Western uh, scholars. Uh, and when Western scholars study Chinese history, they use Western theories and Western measures and Western uh, stick yards to measure and to understand and to analyze Chinese history. Uh, Zhang Wuxi goes against that. And what he says is that uh, Western theories and uh, Western measures, methodologies, not necessarily suitable to understand and to analyze Chinese history that's lived by Chinese people and experienced by Chinese people. And sometimes this native understanding is so essential and we cannot just get rid of. So in, in this paper, he, uh, he advocates having or striking a balance between, under, between the, the understanding and the, of, the, of the outsider, the Western scholars, their approach and the approach of Chinese uh, scholars. So let's uh, go uh, through it with some uh, more details. There is a, a scholar called uh, Paul Cohen, actually Professor Zhang Lungxi quoted him uh, several times because uh, th that scholar, that American scholar, he also noticed the problem. He also noticed that the, these uh, Western scholars who use Western theories uh, and methodologies to analyze and to explain Chinese history, they have some problems and they cannot fully understand the Chinese history if they follow this way. So he divided, what he did that he divided the Chinese history, the, the recent Chinese history into three paradigms. One is from the 1860, let's say from the Opium War until the, the new China, until 1911. Another phase, and that, for example, of course, that first phase, China was uh, very weak, uh, received uh, Western influence and was weak at that time. Then after the, the establishment of and the rise of uh, new China in 1911, until, let's say, 1960s, that's the second stage in which China tried to to be modernized, to be a modern country, and to, to follow the footsteps of the West. And after that, the, from 1960s until our time, uh, some Chinese progressive scholars, they started to project how the Western imperialism crippled the Chinese uh, progress, crippled China's progress, in its, uh, in its way to modernization, to be a modern uh, country. So uh, again, it's this Western-centric approach that was adopted and followed by Western uh, scholars. He suggested, uh, Cohen, Paul Cohen, he suggested a new approach that is China-centric. China-centric meaning we understand and we study, we study China history, the Chinese history from native point of view, from Chinese perspective. We need to understand, we need to study Chinese history from a Chinese point of view, okay? What's the, what Chinese scholars uh, said about their history, how they lived and how they experienced their own history, how they expressed it, we need to bear this all this in mind, and we need also to follow, to take this approach in order to understand the, the Chinese history. He, he says uh, China problems in the double sense that they are experienced in China by Chinese, and the measure of their historical importance is Chinese, rather than a Western measure. This, is, this approach is called China-centric approach, okay? Uh, so he said, this is, these are Chinese problems. That I mean that when this Chinese history is a Chinese problem, is a Chinese object. So we need to put it in 
a Chinese context in order to understand it. An individual experience rather than the totality of historical experience we call China or Chinese history as uh, a whole. So here it's very difficult to understand history as a whole. Usually when any scholar writes about history, he writes about history from his own point of view. So again, it's an individual experience about a certain time, a certain incident in time. It's not about the Chinese history as a whole, not about the totality of uh, historical uh, experience. And so we, we read different opinions offered by different scholars because each of them actually provides his own uh, individual uh, experience and understanding of, of history. Uh, and also he says how the, the infinite, how that infinite understanding is possible for finite human nature. To understand history as a whole is, is something almost infinite, is something very, very difficult. It's very difficult for one person, one scholar, who is finite to understand that infinite uh, history. How can one be omnipresent to, to be everywhere, to understand what has happened in history at the same time in different places? So he, he offers uh, this approach, how to study Chinese history, which is so huge and uh, stretches through, uh, through our thousands of years. How for one scholar to understand all this history like that? So he suggested to divide it into small parts. And instead to use this China-centric, he suggested something region-centered, region-centered, not China-centered, like dividing China horizontally into cities and provinces and study each part alone. So it's region-centered, not China-centered. Uh, uh, and also using Western theories and methodologies of Western social uh, sciences. But while we use their methodologies, we have to, to bear in mind and to, to have also uh, this uh, native uh, point of view from native uh, perspective. We look at this, the, the Chinese history from native uh, perspective while using uh, Western, uh, Western uh, theories. So here, this is very close to what we have, have just uh, said earlier about uh, familiarizing the distance and distancing ourselves from the over-familiar. It combines both. This is the practical application of uh, the, those two steps, the, the reverse telescope uh, technique and, the, and the, te the, the telescope technique. So Professor Zhang here, he asks, are the inside and outside mutually exclusive? Can't they coexist? Can't we have both of them, both the, the, the native, the Chinese perspective and the Western perspective in order to understand the Chinese history. This is what he advocates and this is what he defends. This is his opinion that he, he says, yes, uh, we can, all right? But here he launches his criticism against uh, Western scholars in general, that they, for several decades, they took China as quite the opposite of the West. And uh, even though some says it, that's, that thing started by French scholars, he said, no, it didn't start by French scholars. We also find American scholars follow the same way. They also look at China and Chinese culture as quite the opposite of Western culture, quite the opposite, like the other, l'autre in French, l'autre, the other, citad the other. China is the other of the quite the opposite of Western uh, civilization, Western culture, and so on. So Foucault, Michel Foucault, the French uh, philosopher, 
he came up with this uh, expression, uh, heterotopic, heterotopia, heterotopia. Uh, hetero meaning other. Uh, topia is place. It's like a utopia. Like utopia, for example, when you say utopia, uh, you know utopia, right? It's the very famous uh, Nobel uh, by Thomas More. It's this perfect world, the imaginary perfect. We imagine that there is a perfect world. And it has two pronunciation. One is utopia, utopia. Oh, here it's Latin, of course, all right? This is not English. It's Latin. So, oh, here meaning no, and topia meaning place. So, utopia meaning, if you pronounce it as utopia, it means no place, meaning it's a perfect place that doesn't exist. Too perfect, so perfect that it doesn't exist uh, in reality. Or you can pronounce it as utopia, and you here meaning good. So, utopia meaning good place. Utopia, okay? So here Foucault, hetero meaning other, heterotopia meaning other uh, place. So China is the heterotopia. To Michel Foucault, China is the heterotopia, the other, the other country, the other place. There is West and there is China, okay? Uh, in, in, and Derrida said the same thing. And he said China, of course, De Derrida is famous for his this concept of difference. Difference. It's pronounced difference, but it can be written uh, spelled differently, but it's the same pronunciation. So Derrida also said, said China is a perfect example of this difference, of what is different, completely different from uh, Western uh, culture. There are other scholars also. As I, as I just said, uh, some scholars said, oh, this, the other, taking China as the other, the opposite of Western culture is mainly French products. It's French scholars who started it. And then Professor Zhang countered this uh, claim and says, no, even it, uh, American scholars did that. And he gives some examples of, uh, uh, to show how also the, the, the French scholars, uh, some of them were so ex extremist in the way they uh, depicted uh, China and uh, introduced China. Like for example, Francois Julien, he always, in, in many of his writings, he always compared between China and Greece and especially between ancient China and ancient Greece, and always introduced China and Chinese culture and Chinese civilization as quite the opposite of ancient Greece, quite the opposite. Like he, he introduces two columns, and this is what's done in China, this is what's done in, in Greece, and they're always completely the opposite, okay? And he says here, China presents a case study through which to contemplate Western thought, meaning through China, by through studying China, we understand because it's quite the opposite of Western culture, then we will come to uh, a point when, where we understand Western culture, where Western thought from the outside. Uh, and he said, strictly speaking, non-Europe is China. This is all quotes, okay? This is quotes. He says, strictly speaking, non-Europe is China, and it cannot be anything else. China cannot be anything else but non-Europe, meaning the other, the other that's not Western, the other that's not European. Uh, Marcel Granit also described China and Chinese uh, way of thinking, he called it la pensation was. La Ponce Chinoise, and he also called it La Ponce, uh, La Chinoise mentality, uh, uh, the Chinese mentality or the, the Chinese uh, thoughts, and also introduced it in a way that there is Western thoughts, and the opposite of it is the Chinese uh, thoughts. Uh, Jacques Grenier, he actually uh, explained and justified the failure of uh, the Western missionaries in China due to the different modes of thoughts. Different mode, he said that the, the Chinese mentality, the Chinese uh, uh, mode of thoughts are so different, the opposite of the Western 
uh, mode of thought. That's why Christian uh, missionaries have failed in, in China. And actually, when we look at this point, we find something very similar in Japan. Japan also, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shusaku Endo, the, the Japanese uh, novelist, Shusaku Endo. Uh, he, was, uh, uh, he was converted or born uh, Catholic, I think. I don't remember whether he was born Catholic or converted to Catholicism since he was small. Uh, anyhow, he, he wrote two very famous novel, novels. One is called Silence, and the other one is called uh, The Samurai. And in the two novels, they are almost based on true stories about, uh, about the uh, Christian missionaries to Japan uh, in the 17th, 18th centuries. 18th centuries, I think, and how they failed. And he, he's a, a Japanese, okay? He, he was a Japanese, very famous uh, novelist, very, very good novelist. And, uh, and, and uh, he was also translated into Chinese, actually. And uh, he also, that was his opinion. What he tried to say in these two novels is that even though he was Japanese, but he, this, that, that's his analysis, that the Japanese mentality is so different from Western mentality that they completely reject uh, anything foreign uh, coming to them. That's why they, uh, they rejected any Western religion uh, coming to them. So this point is very similar to what they say uh, here, so what, what Jack Gurney say here. Uh, so China as the other. When, we, when those Western scholars, when they look at China as the other, this is contrastive methods because they only focus on the differences, on how China is different. They don't try to find a common ground, common uh, characteristics, some similarities between what is Chinese and what is Western. They only focus on the differences. So this is a contrastive uh, method. Uh, Richard uh, Nesbitt, for example, he, uh, he doesn't agree with that. He says uh, members of different uh, cultures uh, differ in their me metaphysics or uh, fundamental belief about the, the nature of the world. The characteristic thought process of different groups differ greatly. Uh, no, he actually, he's he's still he's still like falling in line with the, with that the same the same idea that that he says the Chinese uh, understanding of what is metaphysical is so different from from the West. The metaphysical, of course, is or what's meta, meta, metaphysics is the the other life after death. But here. Starting from here, we, we return to Cohen. He introduces this comparative, comparative uh, method, not the contrastive method, not just focusing on differences, but focusing on both similarities and dissimilarities. So Cohen here, as I said, he called for this China-centered uh, approach. And he said China-centered approach tries to get inside China. Get inside China, meaning to understand history, Chinese history, the way Chinese people understand it. Why? To reconstruct Chinese history as far as possible as the Chinese themselves experience it. So, from what he says, it's very, very clear that uh, uh, he's using comparative methods, not contrastive uh, methods. Professor Zhang Longxi calls the, this uh, Western attitude, the way they study Chinese history and the way they apply Chinese uh, Western methodologies and with the Western theories on Chinese phenomena, he calls it social science arrogance. It's their arrogance that what fits them must fit also other people or other nations. Okay, and that they understand, they should or could understand the, the history better than the natives. 
So instead, he says, instead of a hum, this arrogance is social science arrogance, instead of a humble acknowledgement that we do not know the true face of Mount True. Now he quotes the, the final part, final line of the third line in the poem that we, no matter whether we are Chinese or Westerners, we will never know the true face of Mount Lu. Unless Lu, it will always be a comparative question. And uh, we need a compromise. We need uh, different perspectives in order to understand uh, history. And here he will come to offer his own, uh, his own understanding and his own explanation of the poem. Uh, at the, the end of, of his paper. Uh, for example, for example, some Western scholars pose the question, is China a nation state? And uh, a nation state, uh, as a definition of nation state, let's take this definition by Emmanuel uh, uh, Wallerstein. He said, the modern state is a sovereign state Sovereignty is a concept that was invented in the modern world system. So because this modern state as a concept, it was invented in, in the West, does it mean that China before the 17th century, was it also a nation state? Did it have a nation state? Or uh, as they say, they some Western scholars, they, uh, they posed this question. Or was it just an imagined community? Imagined community. China before the 17th century was an imagined community. It, it became uh, a nation state only in the, the 20th century, according to the understanding of some Western uh, scholars. And here, there is a Chinese uh, scholar uh, called uh, Ge Zhao Guang. Ge Zhao Guang. I hope that his, the name of this book is clear. This book is very interesting uh, book. Uh, and he he's a professor in uh, food and industry. And uh, actually, I was lucky to meet him uh, personally because he was invited to come to uh, city, the City University of Hong Kong and to deliver a lecture there, a lecture based on this uh, book. Uh, and, uh, and actually, of course, he contradicted that understanding that China throughout uh, thousands of years was a nation state and had its own uh, personality as a nation, its own characteristics as a nation, uh, unified the language, the writing system, uh, and so many, so many things, the moral principles, the customs, uh, the political systems, all this began thousands of years, at least 3,000 uh, years ago. Uh, and so China thus should not uh, be judged according or measured according to uh, some Western uh, understanding or Western methodologies. So this uh, nation state, this modern nation state cannot be applied to the ancient history of China because that nation state of China existed well before the 17th uh, century. So uh, if I, I read this quote quickly, different from Europe, China's political territory and cultural space spread out from the center toward the peripheries, even without mentioning the pre-Tin antiquity, at least from the time of the Tin and the Han dynasty, dynasties. By unifying the width of vehicle tracks, unifying the written scripts and unifying moral codes, language and writing, moral uh, principles and customs, and the political system began to gradually stabilize, stabilize the nation within this space. And this is quite different from the European understanding of the nation as a new phenomenon in late human history. Okay, this is, this is a very interesting and very powerful argument. I also uh, suggest you to get this book and, and read it if you are interested. He also says the theory that uh, separates traditional empires and modern states into two different eras does not fit in well with Chinese uh, history, nor does it fit the Chinese consciousness of a nation 
or the history of the emergence of uh, a mission. So in other words, he says this Western um, measures, Western uh, understanding uh, uh, doesn't really fit uh, the Chinese history. Doesn't, it's not suitable to understand Chinese uh, history. Now we come to the, the, the poem again. Does the poem in, indicate that only outsiders would understand history better than native, better than the native uh, people, native Chinese, for example, if we talk about Chinese history, is that what the poem says? Uh, Zhang Longxi says, no, it doesn't say, it doesn't say so. He says, okay, viewed horizontally, arranged. When that mountain viewed horizontally, it's like a range, a range of mountains, okay? A cliff from the side, it differs as we move high or low or far or nearby. We do not know the true face of Mount Lu because we are all ourselves inside. Here, Zhang Longxi says that uh, the poem doesn't say that outsiders will understand Mount Lu or see Mount Lu better or have a better view of Mount Lu if they uh, are distant. The poem doesn't doesn't say, say that. The poem just say, uh, says that Mount Lu looks different from different perspectives. And uh, uh, no matter what, pers what pers perspective you use to look at Mount Lu, it will always look different. Whether you are inside or outside, it will look different. The poem doesn't say that only outsiders will know the true face of Mount Lu. Because actually, according to the poem, there is no true face. There is no one single true face of Mount Lu. Mount Lu has so many different faces. It depends on the perspective you look at it. Uh, E.H. Carr, he said, uh, it does not follow that he would take the mountain, Mount Lu, as a metaphor for history, metaphor for understanding Chinese history. So let us consider this Mount Lu as Chinese uh, history. And which approach, which way to study this history uh, is, uh, is the best. He says here, it does not follow that because a mountain appears to take on different shapes from different angles of vision. It has objectively either no shape at all or an infinity of shapes. It does not follow that because interpretation plays a necessary part in establishing the facts of history and because no existing interpretation is wholly objective, one interpretation is as good as another and the facts of history are in principle not uh, amenable to objective uh, interpretation. So he says here there is no objective interpretation for history. There is no objective interpretation. Any interpretation of history is somehow subjective. And that's why one interpretation is, might be as good as uh, another. What Zhang Longxi offers here, the right way of to do comparison, the right way to study uh, history to study any phenomenon, if you want to put it in a uh, in a larger uh, scope, this plurality to adopt plurality of views, plurality of views, and if we put it in line with what we have said earlier at the beginning of our talk, is to distance the familiar and to familiarize the to familiarize the the foreign the foreign uh, phenomenon. So there is no certain view is best. It's not by getting too close or by staying so far. It's by combining both, by adopting both. We need both techniques, both methods in order to, uh, to have a better understanding. No one can claim. He said, we don't claim that one of them is better than the other no one can claim that, but we need both in order to have a better understanding of history.
of any historical phenomenon we study. And uh, the, he says, the more instructive poem, the poem uh, is more instructive poem than a simple description of mountain. It's not just an instrument, it's like he's telling us a message. Suche is like telling us a message that there is no one true face of Mount Lo. Whether you look at it from close distance or from uh, or far away, there is no one true face. At best, insiders and outsiders are all limited in their respective horizon. And this part is very powerful. Are all limited in their respective horizons and finite determinacy. And at worst, the insiders' blind spots. These uh, Western scholars who say that the insiders, the Chinese scholars, they have these blind spots they are, because they are so close to their history there are certain things, many things they do not see. Of course, they have a point. Of course, it, it, to, to, to a certain extent, it's true, okay? But the alternative is not to discard, to discard this native uh, approach completely and say that the Western uh, understanding and approach is the only way of understanding. No, no one can say that. We have, we, or we must, strike a balance between the two understandings, between the two approaches. The Chinese approach, understanding their experience, and also the West, we use the Western methodology and, and theory, theories, but accompanied with uh, Chinese native uh, perspective. So this final part is very interesting, and at worst, the insiders' blind spots are matched only by the outsiders' ignorance and lack of sensitivity. This is very important because if we say, oh, Chinese scholars, they are, because they are native uh, people, they, that's why they, they, they have these blind spots. There are many things they will uh, overlook. Okay, this is matched. At worst, this is matched by the outsiders' uh, ignorance of uh, an insensitivity an understanding of the local culture, okay? So there is, we can't say that both are wrong or both uh, are correct. We need both ways in order to have a better understanding. Uh, Robert Burton says, we are all, of course, both insiders and outsiders, members of some groups. And here, this quote, quotes here is about, uh, we all belong to to some, uh, to some societies, to some groups, some social groups. We all have more than one identity, okay? It's not only if you are Chinese, then this is your identity, but you are also Asian. Uh, identity, you add to your ident first identity, add, and so on. Uh, a, a British guy from an English guy, he's English, but he's European and is Western, and so on. There are several, this is uh, Amartya Sen also says that, that we have different uh, identities, and that's why understanding and explaining history uh, is not an easy thing. It's always subjective, and be be why it's subjective? Because we have different identities. We belong to different uh, social groups. We belong to this group, not that group, and and also it's, it's like circle, one circle contains another circle and so on. Uh, we are all, uh, Amartya said, we are all individually involved in identities of various kinds in disparate uh, contexts in our own respect, respective uh, lives. Let us end by, uh, by reading how uh, Chang Nusi ended the 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 paper his paper it's again you can find this paper online um, it's very interesting uh, let me give you the title show you the title it's called lessons from mount lu china and cross cultural understanding lessons from mount lu by zhang longxi you can find it as a pdf you can download it to read it it's uh, you will enjoy it it's very interesting so let us uh, here says, with such an insight into our plural and interrelated statuses or multiple identities, 
we may now realize that it is untenable to hold that only Chinese can understand China or equally absurdly that only a Western scholar can provide an outsider's objective view. Because whether we like it or not, our understanding will always be subjective. I, I, I dare to say there is nothing called objective. It will always be subjective. Subjective, we are restricted and limited by our own culture and by our own education. So, so whatever our understanding will be, it will always be subjective. Uh, and thus provide us with true knowledge about China. So neither the Chinese way is the, the best way or the Western way is the best way. We need to have both. And they say, understanding China and Chinese history requires integration of different views from different perspectives. But such integration is not a simple juxtaposition of insiders and outsiders views. It not, doesn't mean you just, we, we combine the two views and uh, that's it. We'll take uh, something from here and something from there. No, it's more complex than that, of course. It is more of an act of integration and mutual illumination than simply adding up native Chinese scholarship and Western Sinology. Sucia's poem on Mount Lu is more instructive than a simple description of a mountain, for it speaks more of the difficulty of understanding than the presence of things themselves. Though the existence of the mountain is tacitly acknowledged, acknowledged this difficulty, the limitation of our horizons and our finite determinacy, the difficulty of knowing something far away or up close, far away is the, the Western uh, uh, methodology or approach or way, and close up or up close is the Chinese native scholars constitutes the challenge of China studies as it does all other humanistic disciplines. We need both approaches. And uh, last, here he says, but it also encourages us to open up to different perspectives and other views, to look from various angles, to judge all with a set of intellectual criteria that transcends group uh, allegiances and local identities, and to reach what might be a closer approximation of Mount Lu or whatever it is that we set out to study. So, in short, and finally, he's here, he advocates the, the approach of having both ways, both understanding. The, 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 we use the, the Western methodologies, but supported by Chinese understanding and uh, Chinese uh, perspective. The way Chinese people uh, lived their history, uh, experienced it, understood it. Uh, I think uh, I uh, am done. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please, it's your time to ask questions. If there is any slides you would like to have a look, any quote you want to read, uh, let me know. Um, okay, this is Michelle. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this was fascinating. Oh, thank I, you. Um, a couple of questions. So you, you compare China really to the West and basically when we talk about Western and you made the distinction before between uh, countries in Europe and the United States and you know North America. Uh, yeah. Do you think it's then uh, fair to do the comparison so much from with you know China and the West? It, should it be China and the United States or China and North America versus China in, in uh, Europe? Well, a very good question. And yes, of course. Uh, as I said, they, they look at China as, it's not I, of course, it's not I, it's the, there's the uh, mm -hmm. French and American scholars. Uh, they look at China as the lot, the other of what is mm -hmm. 
on Western. But again, uh, like here, Foucault, he called it uh, heterotopia and difference, Derrida said, and, and, and so on. Uh, but of course, you are right. The, the West itself is so different. And mm -hmm. uh, there is a slide here when I, when I showed uh, scholars here, like, like, mm -hmm. like this French uh, Tocqueville, taking France, England, America as an example, and this one, uh, Jacobs, taking China, Japan, and Europe. But again, Europe is too big mm -hmm. for, for a comparison. I agree. I right. agree with you. It's, uh, it's too wide. It's too Europe. Uh, which you, which part of Europe do you mean? It's too wide. Right. It's India and Western. But maybe it depends also maybe on the on the, the, the topic you are discussing. Uh, because you can't compare China, Japan, and Europe. Everything in China, everything in, no. Uh, definitely they are using one thing, definitely they are, you know, picking one tiny phenomenon. For example, uh, drinking tea, okay? Drinking right. or, or or even this in Europe will be, will not match because in Europe they will have different customs, different tradition. Yeah, I find it, it's, uh, it's too wide. I agree with you, it's too wide. It's mm -hmm. of course, it's better to select just one country in Europe, one country in the West, France, mm -hmm. England, Germany, because they are to totally different, totally different. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe uh, unless we talk about religion, for example, maybe something, something that uh, most of European countries share. In this case, it will make mm -hmm. sense, okay. like Christianity. For example, at a certain uh, period of time, certain time in history, for example, religion in Europe, in Japan, in China, at a certain time uh, in, in the 17th century, for example, or then maybe in this case. So it always depends on the topic, on the comparison okay. unit. Yeah. Okay. Good point. Yeah. yeah. My second question would be around uh, the phenomenon of uh, virtual reality. I can understand that uh, in order to become an insider or to understand a perspective from an insider point of view, it is best to probably go there. Uh, that term give a be, you know, go there, observe it and become immersed in it. Do you think this is possible with uh, virtual reality today? Uh, would it be comfortable of being there and being immersed by using this virtual reality technology? Uh, it's also a very uh, critical question. It Again, also, it, it, it depends on the topic or uh, why you need to be there. Oops. Why you need to be there. If, for example, if you if if the main idea is to understand the the native culture, and to absorb it, to really feel it, to really experience it, of course, here virtual reality uh, cannot compensate, cannot make it up. To be there, to be to be yourself there in person as an insider, to try everything firsthand, this is something uh, very important. Uh, the virtual reality here, the technology, I don't think it will be, will be enough. It, it, it will help those who can't go. Those mm -hmm. who can't go, it will help. But in other, in other way, it depends on the topic. But if the topic, for example, if the topic you uh, to like, uh, like uh, just following the the news or uh, collecting some news, then mm -hmm. I don't think you need to be there. Like, for example, sometimes when I when I think about when I when I think about uh, this uh, uh, spy, the intelligence activities in the past, until maybe the seventies and eighties, and maybe even the nineties before the internet, for one con country to hire a spy to employ a spy to use a spy. That person, that spy, has to be inside the other country, the target country. He has to be there, and he has to write reports and send reports by, by this invisible ink and all of that. But nowadays, all these are primitive ideas, things. All these are primitive. Mm -hmm. 
this mm -hmm. technology, this virtual reality we have, you don't have to, to have somebody over there because you get all the news you want online. But of course, there are certain type of news that you need a certain person in a certain place to get this type mm -hmm. of news. It's classified, top secret news, classified news. Here you need to, to implant that person in a government office, for example, or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so it depends on the mission, why you need to be there. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, it, it, it depends on why you need to be there. Uh, if you if you want to be there in order to study the language, of course, you have to be there in person. If you want to be there in order to write a book about uh, 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 the, the social behavior of people, then you better be there. Uh, it's not enough to gather this, this information online. You need to get this information firsthand. Right. But unfortunately, we have the inaccurate perceptions that we have because we are not there and we do use these other forms of medium to get our information. And so we've got just a, a yeah. quandary. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. So, uh, Dr. Goda. Hello. Hi, I have a very brief question. Uh, hmm. That is... Uh, uh, as you can see that um, uh, nowadays when we are talking about uh, China and the West, it seems that China can uh, can represent uh, the East. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering what is your understanding, whether China represents, uh, represent, represents the East or the East uh, 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 catalyzes a bigger connotations, which includes also Korea maybe, or Japan maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your understanding mm -hmm. of this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, if we say... China represents the East, then we mean the Far East. We don't mean the Middle East. We don't mean the, the Near East. The Near East is the, the North African countries, like Egypt, Libya, uh, Morocco, Tunisia. This is Near East. The Middle East is another part, in the Gulf area, for example, Palestine and so on. But when you say China, if I make a, if I make a comparison uh, between uh, China as a representative of the East and uh, England, for example, as a representative of the West, then I know China here, the, way, the East here means the Far East. And the West here, England, if it represents the, the West, it means Western Europe. It doesn't mean Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe, they have different, uh, completely different culture, sometimes the, the, quite the opposite. So, uh, and again, it depends on uh, the, the, the unit, the comparison unit. If that comparison, if we say, for example, China will represent the East in blah, 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 whatever. If that thing also is adopted in Japan and Korea, if they are adopted and practiced, let's say using chopstick, for example, chopsticks, okay? Mm the way of eating, for example, then yes, it's uh, it's used in Korea and Japan. So if we say China represents the, the East, meaning the Far East, then yeah, it's valid. It's valid. But if, mm. we, if we use something that's not used at all in, in Japan, it's not practiced in Japan and Korea, then, then I think uh, it will not be proper to say here China represents the East, because in Japan they do it differently. In Korea they do it differently. So I think we, we need, again, we need to look at, at uh, for example, the filial piety. Like last week we talked about the, the Asian filial piety and how they care for elderly. And mm -hmm. uh, in Western societies, for example, how they just drop their grandparents in elderly houses. Here we can take China as, as an example of the East, yes. Because I think they are here very close. The culture is so close, whether it's Japanese, Korean, uh, Chinese, 
or even uh, Indian or even Arabic culture, if you go to the Middle East, you will find also this filial piety is still there very strong. Mm -hmm. So we can here take China as a representative of the East, yes, not only the Far East, but the whole East. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Much clearer now. Thank you. A quick question. Do you consider that arrogance you talked about to be imperialism? Uh, arrogance, do you, you mean this uh, socialist studies arrogance, the Western arrogance? Yes. As part of uh, maybe it's an outcome, yeah, residue, residue, or the residue okay. of the Western uh, imperialism. Uh, yes, I uh, sometimes really some Western people they they talk and behave as though they they still live in the 19th century some some yes. of them give me, <laughs> I agree some, some of them, yeah some of them give me this impression that they still live in the uh, 19th century and so long as they are they are white then uh, then they must be correct so okay. yes yes this arrogance could be just uh, the, the residue of their uh, all the imperialism. Uh, okay. I agree. Thanks so much. Thank you, Michelle. Any any more questions? Okay. If uh, if there is no more questions, then uh, next week uh, we'll talk about is it language? I think talk about language and. Uh, the value of culture, something cultural value, something like that. Let me Great. Just... Looking very much forward to it. Cultural values. Yes, Next week we'll talk about cultural values. Yeah. Okay. Cultural Thank you. values. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. You. Thank you all. Okay. See you next week. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.